Hey, my name is Talaka El Esparza, co-founder of Sunhouse, and in this video, I'm gonna show you the full setup process for sensory percussion. So let's get started. So when you first get your sensory percussion box, you should find a welcome card. And on the welcome card, you'll see a website and a download code. So this is the first place to get started. Go to our website and enter the download code and you'll get a welcome email that has a, down, a link to download the software as well as a link to our manual. Also inside the box is a quick getting started card that shows you how to apply the pickup element. You'll find a box of 10 pickup elements and I'll explain what those are in a minute and your sensor. So along with what comes in the box, you'll need a drum with a mesh head or acoustic head, uh, an XLR cable, and you want to make sure that it's XLR on both ends so that it can carry phantom power, a an interface with as many phantom power mic pre's as number of sensors that you want to use, and a computer to run the software. So now I'll show you how to apply the pickup element. The pickup element is what allows the sensor to work. It's a little metal disc that the sensor reads. So it's essentially a guitar pickup and the sensor can sense the motion of the little metal disc. So um, you'll notice that the pickup element is a V shape and that's because it's connected to a placer. So this will tell you exactly how to put it on the drum and get it in just the right spot. So to get started, you will uh, just peel off just the tip of the uh, pickup element the uh, adhesive backing just on the tip like that. Um, line it up to wherever you want the sensor to be in between two, uh, two tension rods, just like that. So line it up against the rim, drop it down, and then peel the legs back up until it snaps off. And you'll just want to apply some pressure onto the pickup element for about 10 seconds to make sure it's secure. And for the kick drum, uh, I like to place it just off to the side, so I have the top of the drum so that I can hit it with a stick. Some people don't do that, so they'll put it on the top. Um, so now let's attach the sensor. You want to place it right over the pickup element so that it's right in the middle of the sensor. You'll notice that the pickup element is right under the tip of the sensor, and that's right where it should be. Uh, not farther back under the light, but right close to the edge where the actual sensor is. So on some drums, especially with mesh heads, you'll notice that uh, maybe the rim sinks too low and there's not enough rim for the sensor to, to attach to. Um, in cases like that, you might notice that the sensor points up instead of parallel. And that can be an issue for um, the software. So you'll want to make sure that you leave enough uh, rim for the sensor to attach to. And one way that you can do that with mesh heads is to loosen these two uh, tension rods um, and tighten the other ones. That will lift the rim up and bring this side of the rim down and should usually leave you enough rim to attach to to get the sensor to be exactly parallel. The same trick can be applied if you have S-shaped hoops or wood rims that are not uh, high enough. Attaching the sensor to the kick drum is pretty easy. Um, easiest if you put it on its side like this, so you can see right where the uh, pickup element is. Just push it all the way down so that it makes contact with the drum head and tighten it. So now I'm going to set up the interface and get everything plugged into the computer. We typically recommend uh, to route your inputs as snare is one, rack tom is two, floor tom is three, and kick drum is four, but you can also reroute those within the software and use whatever routing you want. All right, so once you have it plugged into the interface, you want to make sure that phantom power is turned on and that your inputs are not too hot. You can start by putting it at around nine o'clock and make sure that all the channels are at the exact same volume. Um, you also wanna make sure that input monitoring is off. Some interfaces, that's a physical knob, but on, some, on other interfaces, it's a software setting um, specific to the manufacturer. So now that I've registered, downloaded the software, and got it activated, we can get the sensor set up inside the software. 
So first you want to check your uh, audio interface settings. So open up the audio settings panel right here. And I'm going to choose Scarlet, which is the interface I'm using as my input and output. Um, I'll choose a sample rate of 44.1 kilohertz, which is recommended. Um, you can choose a higher one, but you'll get the best CPU performance at 44.1. And uh, I'll choose a, a buffer size of 128. If you have a particularly fast computer, you might be able to get away with lower. Um, uh, but 128 is the maximum I would recommend for latency purposes. In the input matrix, you can see that I can choose um, any of the four inputs on my interface to be routed to any of the four inputs in the software. So I, since I only have um, one input for my snare and one input for my kick, I'm going to select input one to drum one and input four to drum four. Um, so that's the default for snare and kick and sensory percussion. And for the output matrix, I'm going to select master to go out of channels one and two. If you're a Windows user, the audio settings panel will look a little different. So you want to make sure that you have ASIO selected and that you've downloaded the right driver for your interface. In this case, it's the Focusrite USB ASIO. And uh, you'll notice that there are these two buttons here, reset device and control panel. So to change the sample rate and the buffer size, you'll go to the control panel and select it there. So I'll select 64 in this case. And you'll notice that it'll update. So now let's add a drum to the software. So you'll see that the software is in its default state and there are no pads or anything. So to get started, you'll first need to add a model right down here. So I'll add new, and this is a snare mesh 14 inch. You'll see now that I have the opportunity to name it. So I'll give it a descriptive name so I remember which drum this is. So this is a Ludwig snare drum. And now I can select the the pads, and now I can train it. So first want to check the threshold settings to make sure the signal is uh, coming in correctly. So I'll click threshold, and you'll see that um, there's a little panel that allows you to visualize the hits. So I can set the threshold to whatever I want. So if I set it up here, you'll notice quiet hits are not rec recognized. I like to keep the threshold pretty low, especially on my snare drum, so I can um, employ a lot of expressive playing. If you, uh, if you have a nice tight mesh head or snare drum that is relatively tight and dampened, and you wanna get buzz rolls across, very tight, very fast playing, you can turn up this sensitivity setting right here. Um, which will allow you to capture those really fast, tight hits. Um, if you have a noisy, resonant drum, like a tom, like a floor tom, where you can't even physically play it that fast, or a kick drum, you can bring the sensitivity down, and it'll allow you to ignore noise and um, certain types of resonance that are unwanted. So you'll notice here that it says drum one sensor connected, and auto level is selected. So this means that the sensor is correctly recognized by the software, and the software is able to auto-level the signal. So it's getting it to just the right level that it needs. If you turn auto-level off, you'll notice that um, it, the, the signal jumps down. So with auto-level on, it doesn't matter really what level my interface is at, the software will automatically get back down to the correct level. Um, so for your interface setting, you'll just want to make sure that it's at a good level where the sensor is not peaking and you're not getting any distortions. If you have your sensor plugged in and everything set up correctly, and it says sensor not detected, then uh, there may be an issue and get in contact with us. The Velocity I.O. panel allows you to customize um, the feel of the drum. So if I want it to be very dynamic, so for instance, to have a, a very wide dynamic range where I can play very quietly and very loudly and have that make a very big difference, I can change this panel manually like this to um, change the, the relationship between how hard I hit and how loud the sounds coming out of the computer are. Um, I can also use these presets. So if I click loud, then my hits um, will get to full volume more easily. I won't have to hit the drum physically as hard. And, uh, and that's a preset that's saved per drum.
All right, so now that that's all set up, we can start training the drum. So I would recommend just training a few zones at first to make sure that everything's working correctly. So let's start by training the center and the edge. So here's the center zone. So about 50 hits to start is pretty good. Um, play various volumes, various speeds, um, I'll do flams, things like that. I'll try to play in a natural way, um, in the way that I'm actually going to play the drum when I perform. Um, but I aim right for the center zone. For the edge, I do the exact same thing. Um, but I aim for this outermost band of the drum. So now when I hit the drum, the pads recognize my, my hits. So now I'm going to train the rim tip and rim shoulder pads, and that is hitting the rim of the drum with the tip of the stick versus the shoulder of the stick. And you want to hit the drum wherever you expect yourself to be hitting it while you're playing. So I may come over here um, because I might want to hit that part of the drum when I'm playing. So that looks good. Um, so now, now that that is in place, now we can add some more zones. So I'll add rim shot center. So this is the rim shot where I'm hitting the drum in the very center and the rim right about here. So like that. So let me clear that. Uh, so notice that me touching the drum added some hits and those are erroneous. Um, so I want to clear the drum so that I have a, a fresh slate so i'm going to right click on rim shot center and click clear and now i can start over on that zone and you can have a couple mistakes where you accidentally hit the rim or the head but if you have too many you might want to start over and clear it um, it's best to be as accurate as possible during training um, because you're kind of giving the software the best examples, the most representative versions of those hits. So here's the rim shot edge, and that's just a rim shot but played out towards the edge of the drum like this. All right, so let's check those. Looks good. All right, so now I'll add in cross stick. So cross stick is kind of a tricky one because you're touching the drum and that can add erroneous training hits. So when I train the, uh, the cross stick, I like to bring the threshold panel up a little bit so that my hand touching the drum doesn't actually count as a training hit. So when I actually hit the cross stick, you'll see that my, my finger hits don't count as training hits. So I'll clear this and start fresh. Everybody does a cross stick differently, so you'll just want to train it in the way that you expect you're going to play it during performance. All right, so now I'll add in stick shot, which is when you dig one stick into the drum and hit that stick with the other stick. So when I do the stick shot, I kind of move my stick around a little bit because I'm not always gonna hit it in the exact same spot. So I wanna give it a little bit of variety. Damped is, uh, the way I train it is I put one hand in my cross stick position, I damp the drum, and I hit out towards the edge.
So I usually don't train the shell on a snare drum because I just never hit the shell of a snare drum, but I'll train it anyway. Um, so uh, that being said, that goes for all the zones. If you never want to hit a stick shot, then you don't have to train it. You can customize this to your own playing um, and use the zones that you want and not train the, the ones that you don't. Our presets utilize a lot of the zones, so you might be missing out on certain sounds in our presets, but, um, uh, but you know, it's up to you um, and up to your style of playing. Also, an important note is that you can train the whole drum and um, use the assign to function in the software to make it so that, for instance, I can turn the whole drum head into one zone by assigning the edge to the center. And I find that the best way to um, do sound design with fewer zones for certain kits that don't need that many different sounds. Um, and that is a preset that stays with the kit. So I can go to the next kit that uses 10 zones and then the kit after that could maybe use one or two zones. Um, so it can be part of the sound design rather than part of the training process. So the void pad over here is very useful, especially when you have acoustic drums. The void pad allows you to um, teach the software to recognize uh, alien sounds or sounds that don't belong from your, that don't come from your drum. So, you know, if I clap really hard or if I have a, an acoustic kick drum, it's the kind of the most common use of it. Um, and that causes my snare drum to sympathetically vibrate that could appear as an actual hit in the software. So what you can do is train the void pad to recognize that external sound and void it out so that it's not, that it, so that it doesn't present as crosstalk or unwanted hits. So I have it here at a djembe. You'll notice that if I go to the cross uh, threshold panel and I hit this, that it is making the drum recognize hits. So. What I can do is just go over here to the void pad, click learn. And now when I hit the djembe, the void pad lights up and I can still play the drum at very sensitive volumes. So now let's train the kick drum. So I'm gonna add a model to channel four, which is my kick drum channel. This is a kick mesh 18 inch and it is a Gretsch drum. So uh, first check out the threshold panel. You'll notice that sometimes certain bass drum pedals that are noisy or creaky or uh, old will make a lot of sound on their own. And so you may want to consider bringing your threshold panel up above that noise um, so that those, that pedal noise doesn't count as kick, as hits. You can still get pretty good velocity sensitivity even if your threshold is, is relatively high. So I'll put it right about there. So I'll train the closed uh, zone, which is when I'm kind of heel up and digging into the bass drum head. And I'll train the open pad, which is when I let the head resonate, kind of a heel down technique. All right, that looks pretty good. And uh, I'll train the rim tip. The rim shoulder. And uh, I'll just leave it there. There's also hardware, to, hardware and shell, but I don't find myself often using those zones. Okay. All right, so now that I have it trained, um, I can play the drum and uh, test it out. So if you, uh, in playing, notice that something isn't um, giving you the hit that you'd expect, like I hit a stick shot and I get a edge or something. You can always go back in and tweak the training by adding more. So that can happen 
um, by, you know, when you're training, you're not really in play mode. And when you're in play mode, you might realize you hit the drum in a slightly different way. So you can go back and add that hit into the training so that it recognizes that type of playing. Um, but you want to make sure that your number of training hits doesn't exceed 100 hits per pad. It will uh, tax your CPU more and most likely it's just not going to work as well. So if you find that your training isn't working well, um, the best thing to do is to clear it and train it from zero. And uh, if you find you need to retrain the entire drum, just load a fresh model from the uh, load model menu. Um, so for the most part, I find that when I train my drums in my studio or during rehearsal, then I take it into my car and put it on stage and uh, I hopefully have a sound check. The training is usually pretty good and stays intact and maybe I'll have to um, add a couple training hits here or there. Um, sometimes I don't have to touch it at all. But if something in the car happens, like it's five degrees outside and it's 100 degrees in your car and uh, your head detunes for whatever reason, you might find that you, uh, you will want to retrain it during sound check. Hopefully you have a sound check. Um, but training the drum, once you get good at it, can be done really quickly. Um, you know, I can train a drum, each drum in under a minute. Um, so it's not, um, not infeasible to do that on stage. So now that everything's trained, we can actually start playing some sounds. So if you look in the software on the left-hand side, you'll see our library uh, area and a, full, a uh, tab called Kits. And Kits is where all of our presets live. So click on kits, you'll see a bunch of options, um, including our CNC kits, which are acoustic drums, um, some recent releases like Hypnagogia and Galactic Brian, which have some great sounds in them. So I'll just double click on one of them. And there's a whole list of kits that I can now drag and drop into this top navigator area. So I'll drag and drop something called Glum Octopus, and that'll load up. And now we can start playing. <laughs> Slag. So playing our presets is a great way to get started because you can look inside them and see how they're built and see how we're using controllers, controlling effects, controlling samplers in various interesting ways. Um, so it's a place, great place to get started with diving into the software. Um, but you should also check out our online manual, which has a, a, a deep dive into all the functionality of the software. It's searchable, it's really easy to use, there's GIFs, and that's probably the best resource for learning how to use the software.